How many people we got on? The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everybody. It's Gil. It is uh, midday on Wednesday, midweek as well. We're actually the exact midpoint of the week. And, of course, the story of the market is pretty obvious. Uh, what's, what's the scenario here that everybody's looking at? And that is that the budget deficit or the budget debt ceiling issue is the driver here. And the market's all over the place based on the news of the day regarding whether they're closer to a uh, settlement or not. You know, the, the bottom line is there's probably going to be something happening. But I think let's look at what's obvious here. And we were kind of hashing this out this morning and debating it, I don't know about vigorously, but we, we were definitely debating it because the issue then becomes uh, what is the market really doing? Is this all about today's you've got heavier volume today? You're coming down pretty hard off the peak. You're still in this choppy zone, as you see on the NASDAQ chart here. And uh, you, you wonder if just the action itself, where you have some distribution days in here, if this means that the market, regardless of what happens with the debt ceiling, the market could roll over here. I guess it could break out, too. There's been some talk that the Fed needs to bring QE3 into play here, and we'll see if that happens. But for right now, I think you have to take it at face value. So you got distribution today. We'll, we'll see where this closes. But it's a very challenging environment if you're trying to play stocks because on the one hand, if you're long and they don't uh, have any settlement, they just continue to go with this brinksmanship, then you're subject to some volatility on the downside. If you try and go short here, you might start out making some money, but if there's news of a, of a debt ceiling settlement, then you may see these things rally in your face very sharply. So it's very tough. So really the way we've been playing it primarily has been uh, with the precious metals. And so if we look at the, uh, what I got here, I got my daily chart. Um, and as I read, shift to the SLV. Now, so our, the debate we had this morning is we're pretty heavy in these things and big in the AGQ and, and just very heavy here. So what we decided to do after vigorous debate we compromised. Uh, I, I felt we should just sell all our precious metals this morning and then look to buy back. So we compromised and sold half our position here. Uh, whether that turns out to be the smart thing to do or not is not, not necessarily clear, but that's what we decided to do. We'll buy back real quickly if it turns back to the upside. But the thinking here is that if you do have a debt ceiling uh, agreement, then these are going to sell off. But you know, the, the other part of this debate, and Dr. K, I know you're out there. Feel free to chime in. Uh, is that you know the market may already know this, so maybe today what you're seeing is the sell-off in advance, and when the news actually comes out, the precious metals don't do very much. So uh, it's not as if you're breaking down in any kind of meaningful way. Your volume is up today compared to the last three days, but you know your volume is pretty good here and here, but that didn't seem to derail it just yet. And you're holding above the 10-day. Not that that's relevant uh, for the SLV just yet, but it's just showing that you are still holding up in the uptrend. So you know, sometimes trying to finesse things uh, can can get you off track, but we think that uh, just kind of laying back, taking some profits on the precious metals, not a lot, and just laying back and letting things play out to see what happens here. You know, we're still half in, and that's pretty heavy anyways. Uh, so we'll continue to benefit, but we just kind of want to see what happens here. And I don't think it's necessarily clear that if there is a debt ceiling uh, agreement that it means that the PMs or the precious metals, we call them the PMs for short, that's our pet name, uh, the PMs necessarily are going to come off real hard. It may be that the market understands something that we've been thinking about for quite a while, which is simply that if the debt ceiling is raised, what does that mean? Does it mean that the, the dollar is going to continue or you're going to turn back to the upside and rally uh, because everything's wonderful again? No, what it means is they just raise the ceiling on borrowing and spending. So it means more of the same uh, monetization and devaluing of the dollar, monetizing the debt, devaluing the dollar. And so it gets back to this thing, this two-pronged scenario that we see, which is default or devalue. So default, if they don't come to a deficit or a debt ceiling agreement, that's what's on the table here, I guess, and the precious metals rally on that basis. But I think now if you get a pullback here, you've got to be stepping in because that, if they do raise the debt ceiling, which we think they are going to do, I think that's kind of a slam dunk. We'll see what really happens with this brinksmanship. But if they do, then again, it just means more fiat money printing, more borrowing and spending, which again is, is negative for the dollar. 
positive for precious metals. So while in the short time, term the media is really playing up that, that the precious metals are moving on this news, yeah, that's part of it, but we don't really think that that's the underlying factor, which is going to be essentially continued downside movement in the dollar. And you see some bounce in the dollar after under, undercutting this low on a gap down yesterday, but you are breaking down through these lows, and it's still looking pretty uh, negative here. So that's not really uh, showing us anything that, that tells us the dollar is suddenly going to rise from the dead and begin this glorious new rally. So the theory with the precious metals is simply continued devaluation of the dollar and uh, continued borrowing and spending. So if it isn't default, it's devalue, and either one, in our view, is good for the precious metals. So uh, that said, you know, we could come back in here and buy our precious metals 60 cents lower, but uh, we're going to hang out and see what happens here. What's your take on this, Dr. K? Yeah, well, um, we were also talking earlier today about uh, on Friday near the close, if no debt ceiling agreement has been reached, that on a risk reward basis, it would be smart to sell any remaining precious metal holdings we have, simply because the odds of a, an agreement being reached over the weekend are pretty high. And if, if an agreement is reached, that could create a gap down in precious metals on Monday's open, which would be a buying opportunity for precious metals. So in other words, we could and, and finesse the trade by saving maybe a couple percentage points, a few percentage points by uh, buying in on a Monday open or wait, waiting to see what happens to the precious metals, how they act on Monday should the debt settlement uh, agreement be reached over the weekend. Right. So in a sense, what we're looking at then is we picked off, uh, we sold half of our, of our precious metals today, but we were all the way in. Uh, about 100% in, a little more, and so we decided to back off, go to like 56%, I think. And uh, if if uh, we go into the the weekend on Friday and we're hanging out here, we may take the rest off the table. But there will be some debate about that, I think, Dr. K, when we get to Friday, uh, as always. <laughs> of course, you agree? keep it fun. <laughs> so you know, we tossed it around uh, this morning, and I, I wanted to blow out everything when. Silver was at 40.13, and uh, we decided on half. So maybe that's the more prudent, uh, prudent route to take. Uh, in the meantime, you see gold is still holding the breakout. And I was on TV yesterday, and that was a very bizarre debate. I never heard anybody debate on the basis of uh, only rich people buy gold, and gold is a Ponzi scheme, and you should be buying productive assets. That's what the other guy said. And I don't really want to get into a big debate over what the other guy said because it really doesn't, to me it's all just financial theater and so I give them what they want. Uh, similar to what I did on uh, BNN, the Business News Network out of Canada uh, last week on Apple because really on Apple technically it broke out through 360 and change. Uh, you can't be bearish on it unless it breaks down. So I was just trying to present some counterpoints to what the analyst was saying. But yesterday, I said, you know, you could have, if they announce a budget or a deficit deal, you could have a 10 to 15 percent pullback in the metals. I kind of think that's extreme. I really meant more like 10 to 15 percent in the SLB or the AGQ, which are much more volatile. That's what I was thinking in my head. But with gold, you know, I think you're going to have to hold, at least hold the breakout uh, level at around uh, 1559, 1559, which would be somewhere around here. We're using 151.86, but notice gold is also holding up okay today. It's not really uh, the end of the world yet uh, for gold. So, you know, it's been very strong. So it's entitled to some backing and filling in here. But yesterday, uh, I thought that was weird because, number one, uh, if, if gold is a Ponzi scheme, then the capital appreciation, buying any asset for capital appreciation, which is what you do with stocks, unless you buy a stock that pays a dividend, uh, capital appreciation, then, is a Ponzi scheme. But go look up Ponzi scheme. I didn't scheme understand that comment, that, that remark of his made absolutely no sense because what he's essentially saying is uh, let's go back to a non-capitalist society. You know, capitalism is evil because anything that goes up in value, therefore, is reminiscent Ponzi of a scheme. Uh, Ponzi scheme. Right, right. But, of course, you know, buy, if you buy gold, uh, the seller knows what the price is, you know what the price is, and you know what's happening. It's not like somebody's sucking your money in and then paying you off with somebody else's money that they suck in later. Uh, it, it's it's kind of nonsensical. And then the idea of a productive asset. I mean, common stocks are not a productive asset. If you bought a pregnant cow, that might be a productive asset. If you bought an oil well that's uh, pushing oil up out of the uh, 
out of the ground. And uh, an interesting story that this one br brings up, I remember when Bill Griffith, our trader, uh, operations director, he's out there, Bill, uh, I went down to see him. He's visiting his sister down in Huntington Beach, and the guy across the street has a lot next to his house. And these are a bunch of nice houses. But the guy across the street next to his house has an open area that he has an oil well pumping oil out of a out of the ground. So it's like a, one of those oil pumps that looks like a horse with his head going up and down as it's pumping oil. And I thought that was pretty funny because now that's a producing asset. So you know if, if you're talking about producing assets and you need to buy an oil well like that, you need to buy a pregnant cow or maybe a dog that's about to have a litter of 12 puppies. But I just thought that was all kind of bizarre. Well, yeah, I didn't understand uh, the, yeah, that comment either. Made no sense where he said um, that stocks are productive assets. They're not. They represent a productive asset, just like SLV and GLD, which are ETFs. <laughs> they represent productive assets because, gee, you know, gold is used in industry. So is silver. Silver is all over the place. So these right. represent productive assets. So I didn't right. understand his comment. It absolutely made no sense. When I was yeah, it, it was, it was I said, am I hearing this right? I actually played it back twice because I didn't think that the I thought I misunderstood what the commentator was saying, but no, he that he really believes that. Yeah, well I was sitting there wondering how how do you debate this exactly? Um, so it wasn't really did I was a debate. I was hoping somebody would offer some uh, insight into what the dollar is going to do and the, the debt ceiling and all that and the dynamics of gold and silver as alternative currencies. So you know, to the extent that the dollar is a producing asset, then so are gold and silver, since they're all just alternative currencies. You notice, you know, we talked about this last week, the French, or uh, I'm not the French franc, but the Swiss franc uh, has been trending higher. The yen has also been trending higher. And my favorite currency is the Canadian loonie, uh, which has been trading higher. I remember being in Vancouver about 10, 15 years ago and getting $1.29 uh, Canadian for every U.S. dollar. And I think you're getting about 90 Five cents U.S. for every Canadian dollar. So any Canadians out there can can correct me, but uh, you know that's really what the gold and silver story is all about. So, um, anyways, as far as stocks go, it's very tough to really hit something on a bullseye. You know, you can do this. We talked about QuestCore. You had a pocket pivot in here. Oh, it's down in here, I guess. Was there another one in here, Dr. I don't know, but see that thing's coming. No, out. We, we had we had that one pocket pivot on that breakout. The problem was that uh, it, it moved up very quickly and it became a bit extended relative to the whole pattern. So yes. in other words, you know, you can choose to buy it way up there um, or, or you can wait for a pocket pivot which never came uh, un until today's uh, viable gap up. Yeah. But see, this is the funny thing about the market is that there are risks that I will take in my own portfolio because I actually did end up buying this um, some weeks ago and just sitting on it because it's not violating any of my sell rules. So I mean, it's just it's not really doing anything for the whole month. And then you know it has a it has a good news today. And also yesterday, yeah. you'll notice that the the stock sold off pretty hard toward the close on volume, well intraday volume. And I I watched that and uh, I thought, well, th this is this is maybe a clue that the earnings are going to miss. But I decided to just sit on the position simply because. <laughs> I haven't. It hasn't violated any of my sell rules, and it's still in the base. And overall, the volume for the day is really not that big. So weighing right. all that together, I decided, well, you know what? Uh, I'm gonna. I don't want to be breaking my rules. I'm just gonna sit sit with it. So you know, but it it is earnings roulette in this market because we've seen plenty of gap downs um, in this market as well as as these kinds of gap ups. So um, you know, my position oh, size one for you. small enough that I could comfortably sit on it. Yeah, Illumina, <laughs> nice. Panera Bread today, Brett got down. Even Cat broke down uh, on earnings, and it hasn't really been able to rally. So it is earnings roulette, so it's tough to play stocks. I think the one that I like best, but this almost seems more like a trade than anything else, is this one coming up through here on the pocket pivot. And it got going yesterday. There was some news out about General Electric reporting that there's shortages of rare earth metals. Uh, it's pulling right back in here. We've got a position we're hanging on to it, but... Uh, in my high octane trading account, I uh, got blown out on a tight stop on the trailing stop. I, I thought the same should have kept going, but it's really a market uh, question right now. If the market's remaining weak, uh, then I think uh, you're not going to see stocks on the long side continue uh, moving strongly. So it almost seems like it becomes a trader now. Earnings come out, I believe, uh, August 13th. So you know, it may not do much from here. You may you may have the sweet part of the move or the sweet spot here out of the way. So 
Um, we have a position, we'll, we may hang on to it going on earnings, but it'll have to stay scaled properly. So, meanwhile, we've had some questions about FIO, and I think it's interesting because we had set a 29.95 hard stop on our position, and we uh, we blew out of there automatically. So we had a stop loss order in, and once it broke that, we were gone. Now it's set up, and I like there's a little trick here you can do. If you have a stock that undercuts, and you have a prior low in the base pattern here and it starts to move up here, you can actually try and buy it in here. And uh, I was buying X up in here and ran up a couple of bucks uh, on a shakeout, but you never got the volume I was looking for, so it may need to base further. I still like this story on Fusion IO, but it may just need to base, so I would definitely keep this stock on your watch list. The other one that we're watching here, and uh, we have a little position in it, very small, but uh, and we did get stopped out here on this violation of the 10-day, but what I noticed is the volume is drying up uh, very sharply today, and you're 88% below average. Now, I've noticed when, uh, and these are studies I did back in the early 2000s. I, I, I have to have Dr. K uh, perhaps redo some of these studies, but when you have a stock forms a cup of the handle, and you're in the handle, and you get a volume dry up like that, less than, more than negative 65% uh, below average, and it gets real tight, a lot of times you can start buying a little bit there anticipating a breakout. Now, a breakout would have to occur through 110, and that's kind of where Dr. K is looking at buying this himself. Now, I'll come in here and nibble on this. I might be wrong. It really depends on uh, what the market does here. But if there is a budget uh, or debt ceiling deal, uh, this may pop out of here. Earnings come out on August 4th, so that's not till I believe, next uh, Thursday. So we'll see what's going on with that. But so far, a cup of the handle. Volume is drying up as it pulls back. That's actually constructive. So you can't say that it is not constructive. So there's a couple of ways to play this. If you're daring like me, you can come in here and pick off a little, little bit, uh, take a small position, anticipating that it should hold maybe this low. I mean, enough so that if you do get knocked down here, it's not going to really hurt you that much. But you're in a little bit. You could break out to the top here and start adding there. Uh, because I think if it gets to the top of this area here, we have most of the congestion, then it's probably heading for 110. What it does at that point, you have to watch. But it is something to keep an eye on here. Uh, and I do have a small position I've taken on that basis. We'll see if I'm yeah, right. The, the, the longer this uh, this stock trades sideways in this quiet mode, um, this this 110 target, basically uh, the high of uh, one, I think it was 110.50. Um, that can be reduced down to perhaps that other uh, secondary high, which was made at 105.6. So you could you could put yeah. a buy stop in just above that. Um, right. I don't, right now it seems a little premature because the stock is still going back and forth, but it's quieting down nicely. So uh, you know over the ensuing days, um, adjusting one's buy stop on on stocks should be a regular exercise as the pattern pattern tightens up. Right. So my thinking is it should probably hold the 20-day right now, which is at 99.16. So, uh, and when it does pull back, it seems to get some support. But right now, it's probably mostly a market question. Uh, meanwhile, you know, anything else out there is not really getting me excited here. Uh, I'm going to go through some of the questions we have. So if you have any names you want us to talk about, uh, please feel free to throw them up. Um, somebody says, uh, portfolio still 25% long silver and gold. Well, the portfolio simulator on the website is still 25% long silver, the SLV, and 25% long the GLD, and 10% long MCP, which it took at uh, 59.44. So it's hanging in there right now, but we'll see how that pans out. But you know, the, the portfolio simulator did not go in. 100% or more, uh, and so that's very aggressive, and the way we run our own portfolios is not the same as that, so keep that in mind. And if there had been any changes in the portfolio simulator, you would have seen an alert. So asking us in this webinar what the portfolio is doing really doesn't uh, make any sense, because we would have put an alert out there. Sorry, Ed. Uh, but anyways, uh, GLD are the ANSA sign of topping. Uh, no, I don't think so. They're actually a sign of power. So a lot of times you'll see stocks uh, do this on a breakout. And the ANTS indicator is up when you're up 12 out of 15 days in a row or better. And this is something that we used to use at O'Neill. Uh, and and where we would like to see it, generally where I've seen it work best is when you have a breakout and they show up sometime, you know, a couple, three weeks after the breakout. So it's showing you the stock 
or in this case the ETF, the gold ETF, is showing a fair bit of strength on the breakout. And so usually that breakout will then be uh, followed by a pull pullback. So even here you saw you had a pullback and you come out to new highs. So you, know, you could pull back here and you come out to new highs again, you could be buying on that basis. I like these volatile markets these days, it doesn't really work as well as it has in the past. So it's not necessarily, it's not a sign of a top at all. It's actually, if you're seeing it uh, late in a big run, then maybe that's true. And that's what we saw, say, in SLB, okay? As you're coming up, you're seeing this at the peak in here as it's getting extended. So if you saw this in conjunction with a climactic type move, yeah, that might be more indicative of a, of a top, but you could also figure out it's a top simply from what it's doing on its own without the little black triangles the little ants or teepees. I don't know. You call them whatever you want. I like ants better. Uh, but in any case, I do, we don't see that as a sign of topping, especially when the stock just or the ETF just came out of a base. It ten, tends to be at this stage more of a sign of strength. Okay. Um, so here's a question for you, Dr. K. Uh, given today's continued recent distribution in the index and leaders, is the MBS getting close to a neutral or sell signal? MDS? You mean MDM? MDM, I'm sorry. Um, well, uh, it is, sure. I mean, whenever you have selling uh, pressure, uh, it pushes the model that much closer to a neutral or a sell signal. So, yes, we are certainly closer to a switch in signals than we were, uh, say, a couple days ago. Yeah, but you're just close. It doesn't mean that you have. So there's really nothing to try and anticipate. Right. It's standpoint. not a good idea to preempt. I found uh, I've tried to get cute with the model and try to preempt it when I was so certain about a signal change, and it doesn't really doesn't work over time because the market lives to surprise, and sometimes it'll reverse on you, and the model won't switch signals, and you're left uh, having switched on your own account. So uh, I just go by the by the model which detects the selling and buying and selling pressure in the markets and leading stocks. Yeah. Um, also, here's a question for you. How do you handle the TNA if the model's in buy mode? Well, you have to, TNA being a three times ETF is obviously going to be three times as volatile. Therefore, when you initiate a position, you should make sure that your sell stops are placed in a manner that will not whip you prematurely out of the position. And you should also make sure that your position size is in keeping with your risk tolerance levels. So, you know, know that uh, if if uh, the model traditionally uh, has fail-safes that kick in within 2%, traditionally, that, that doesn't mean it's always going to happen. Sometimes on a vol more volatile market or unusual market environments like the one we're in, uh, we could have a fail-safe kick in at 3%, or let's say in a worst case, maybe 4%. That's highly unusual. But given that, um, TNA, a vehicle like TNA could uh, have a uh, drop as much as 12%. So uh, keep all that in mind and, and always position size uh, so that you're not breaking your rules. Yeah. So on the LinkedIn, uh, you know, if you're buying a little bit in here, you have to decide what your stop is. Somebody's asking me what my stop is. I don't really know. I have to see what happens if it starts to sell off. But I would think it would hold the 20-day moving average in the short term. So that could be a reference. It doesn't mean it's going to work 100%. I mean, we use a a violation of a ten, the 10 day moving average here is our stop and you can see that we got shaken out on that. It doesn't mean we can't come in and buy because you're only talking about a difference of 3 or 4 percent. As far as we're concerned, we're not interested in 3 or 4 percent in here. We're interested in being in the stock when it starts to launch and maybe that doesn't happen until earnings. So we're showing August 4th. Any of you who are looking probably at O'Neill data might be showing uh, 728 which would be tomorrow. Uh, but a lot of times that data is inaccurate. And uh, another thing I noticed is that it looks like the data on MarketSmith updates before the data on Wanda, which is kind of bizarre when you consider that Wanda is supposedly an institutional product. Um, somebody was giving me the latest mutual fund data on a stock, and it had already updated for March, whereas uh, Wanda, which is supposedly an institutional product, had not, which I think is kind of bizarre. So. I don't know if I trust this. I'd uh, check with the company uh, or use uh, briefing.com. I'll tell you uh, what's going on there. And so what we have on briefing, if, for those of you who use briefing, you can just go there and type in the symbol. And I'm going to do that right now. And I'm showing uh, earnings con next earnings release August 4th after the market. They're looking for $0.03 cents a share. So 
Um, I'm thinking LinkedIn might do okay on earnings. We'll see. I mean, a lot of people, the expectations are very low for them, so we'll see what happens. Um, somebody asking about Acme Packet, would you short it here? Uh, I suppose you could try to short it here. I don't really think the pattern is all that in position. You're right at a support level here. You're at your retest of this breakdown here. It seems to me that you could try and rally back up to the 50-day. But remember, the big problem with trying to short right now is that if you do get some news about the debt ceiling uh, agreement coming into play or being made, then you might see these stocks suddenly uh, flip to the upside and you get ran. So I'm not really willing to play the short side here just yet. Um, last week we did talk about two stocks that had broken down uh, right here exactly one week ago we were seeing Aruba and it never really got back up to the tune a day and it's continuing to break down. See now notice how it's coming down in here. I think it's liable to rally. It's possible you could have tried to short this thing here, uh, but I think you're too far down now. But you'll notice these were the things I was looking at, mainly because the patterns are a little bit more uh, formed out. Here, this has already come down. You're undercutting this low. And to me, it looks like it wants to rally. Um, let's look at a weekly chart on all of these. Let's see, where, where's my weekly chart? Where'd it go? Again? Here we go. So this is at five. This is your big head. There's a little shoulder here, and you got a bunch of shoulders, and now it's starting to break down. But it seems to me I'd look for another rally in here if I was going to try and short it. Aruba also looks better as a short simply because you have the big head, your left shoulder here, the head right here with the big volume break. Remember, the big volume break is what you're always looking for off the peak because that defines the right side of the head. So you get your two shoulders in here. And now you're breaking down. If your neckline is like this, you're probably heading for the neckline. But remember, you just undercut this low, so you might have one more rally. But like I said, I'm not so sure I'm all that uh, excited about trying to short this market. It's too choppy. And uh, coming off the peak the last couple, three days, uh, it might be a little bit too obvious to be going short. But uh, what I'd be looking for are stocks that are set up in these patterns. Now, what do you notice here? I mean, yeah, you can look at this and say, yeah, here's a left shoulder, here's a head. But... Do you really see the big break off the peak on heavy volume that would define the right side of the head? There's no real huge volume spike on the downside. In fact, the volume spike occurs right here at the 40-week moving average, which is also the 200-day. So I'm not so sure this is going to break down. Uh, and so I would not, well, I wouldn't be shorting it here. You know, some people ask about. And we always get emails asking us about stocks. But remember, we, we don't give personalized investment advice. We operate under an SEC publisher's exclusion, and so we're not here to answer and give advice on individual stocks um, when you email us. We're just not going to do that. It's also not fair to other subscribers as well. But Yoku, I'm not going to buy Yoku or Yuku. Uh, is this a pocket pivot? Hey, Dr. K, is this a pocket pivot? It's a pocket pivot, but it is a risky pocket pivot because the stock is yeah, so far awesome. down and there's so much downside momentum in this name. And, uh, I mean, it's all over the map. So you've got a lot of volatility going on, and that translates into risk. Therefore, uh, play at your own risk, really. Uh, uh, yeah, and these bottom stock, fishing pocket you know, pivots are, are tricky, you know. Right, Dr. K? Sorry, what's that? He's trying to bottom – the bottom fishing pocket pivots too soon off the lows – you know, this right. really this hasn't round rounded out. out a low yet. It needs to round out, right. and, uh, you know, then, then I'll have a little more confidence in it, and then, and then it's possible that this will issue a pocket point, a po pocket pivot at some point because of the right. nature of what the company does. Uh, I guess yeah, there... let's, go, let's go back to MCP, uh, Molly Corp. You know, this is rounded out a little bit, and you have one, two, three waves to the downside. The third wave doesn't come down as far as the 200 day so that's showing some strength this is rounding out more and so it's much better position than than yuku which is a, just a crazy stock yeah, and if you look at the uh, prior uh, part of mcp say on the uh, on march 22nd <clears throat> that had finished rounding out so that could be bought on that pitch pocket pivot which uh, right. i believe right. to report on and also um, prior to that there was um, in one in <clears throat> december um, december uh, 13th that the stock had enough rounding out. Um, it had actually a pocket pivot on the six, um, which may have been bought, um, although there's a little bit more risk there because it hasn't really finished rounding out. And then um, on the 13th, you can buy that with more confidence. 
And it's interesting right. because so both of those cases, the stock rocketed uh, something like 50, 50 to eighty percent off those pocket pivots. Yeah. So you know, the junky stocks. Yuku is a junky stock. You know, and maybe it goes higher, but look at that big drop. It's not. It's barely had time to uh, round out. LinkedIn. Will you hold through earnings? I don't know. I have no idea. If it goes up 20 points in my, what are your opinions on Amazon and Netflix? Well, Amazon, there's no real reason to have an opinion. Uh, Amazon is a uh, gap up here, but it's kind of trading mid-range, so it's going to depend on the market. So that's all it is, a viable gap up. You use the low of the day right here, which would be 227, or I'm sorry, 222.26 is your stop. So you're only a couple of points above that, so if you wanted to try and buy here, I guess you could. Uh, but again, it's a market question. So are we piling into it? No. If you want to pile into it, I guess you could. But it can be traded on the basis of using that 222.26 low as your stock. So, you know, there's no, there's no magic opinions. There's no, we don't have any magic crystal ball that tells us whether Amazon's going to continue going higher or not. You know, we've seen Netflix, which this is one of the craziest stocks. And this will actually allow me to segue into another question that somebody asked earlier. Uh, but, you know, Netflix, and then it pulls back. And it's done this the whole way up, you know. It's just, it's just this big chop and slop type of situation. Try to get through 300, and it failed. Now, you break down here. You come through the 50-day, and, and everybody wants to get short here. I think that's a little premature as well. What I would watch is for the second rollover because that probably takes you down through uh, for good. But again, you've got you've had a lot of shorts and you still have a lot of shorts in uh, Netflix and they may be in here covering. So I, I wouldn't come after this necessarily right here. I'd look for something that's in a, in a much better uh, position. Now, if we look at the weekly chart on Netflix, this is what it looks like. So there's no topping pattern yet there. Even if you consider this to be a, a, a failed breakout, what are you breaking out of? A four-week base? So that's not really a base. This really was your breakout. So it hasn't really failed down through these levels yet. So I think it's premature to be trying to short sell it. And if I haven't put anything out on the short sale setup section of the website, then I don't think it's shortable. And you notice we really haven't put anything out, and primarily because I think there's too much news here. And you're more... Uh, likely to run into a problem trying to short a news-oriented market than trying to go long. So I think there's a lot more risk. I mean, it, there is enough risk with the earnings roulette season and the choppiness around the news regarding the death of debt ceiling uh, to make the long side difficult and treacherous. So I think it makes the short side even more difficult and treacherous. Uh, but if you catch something, you know, it's, it's somewhat gratifying. An Aruba would have been nice for example, the catch coming down off the uh, off the 50-day moving average here. So as you broke down, you rallied up. But still, you know, it's, a lot of this is really, in my view, still in play. Technically, a Rubo wouldn't become a clean short until it broke the neckline. So if you're shorting in here, you're trying to short on the right shoulder, but you can get away with it. And I was actually shorting the stock up in here, and I didn't, you know, let it play out long enough uh, to really score a big profit, but that just shows you how difficult it is to try and come in here and short the market. So with the precious metals getting bopped around, the miners get bopped around even more. So I, I've always felt, you know, this one's trying to round out, and you have these pocket pivots in here, uh, right in here, I think this is one, but you know, it's, it, to me this is a, a lower quality miner. I like to Majestic, first majestic silver better, but it's very volatile. It came straight up off the bottom, so maybe it's got to form a handle in here. Pulling back here, do you buy it? That's a tricky one. I would rather play the metals than the miners, okay? And I know people uh, always look at these. They're exciting because they will go up faster when the when everything starts moving to the upside, but they also come down a lot more sharply, and they're, they're very difficult uh, to ride. We still think the SLB, the GLD, and they're too... Uh, siblings, two times leveraged siblings, the AGQ and the DGPP are better to play than the miners. So that's our take on them. But you, know, you can try and play them. Uh, somebody asked about TPX, uh, Tempur-Pedic. Uh, is that a viable gap up? Well, technically it looks like it is. Is that Dr. K? Uh, that would be viable, sure. That would be uh, a viable gap up, that is. 
Uh, the yeah, stock, your average stock, range. Stock. I saw this. I saw this um, uh, a few weeks ago, and then caught it on the opening um, in terms of the the earnings announcement. Um, and it's it, you know it's it's a good stock. It's it's a very gray area though. It's um, in terms of putting out a report on it. You know, I almost did, and then I decided at the last minute not to. But you know, it, if you if you play or if you're playing this, there's nothing wrong with buying the stock. I just didn't feel it quite made the cut. Yeah, I actually have a Tempur-Pedic bet, and uh, I bought it uh, last year, and I thought for sure that would have been the top of the stock, because usually when I buy something, that's it, but uh, they're actually pretty good bets. I used to have, uh, like, stiff back in the morning, and now it's not, so ever Do you since sleep I got that, that bet, yeah, much better, so. Because I've tried them out at the department store. They, they do seem really good, so I was actually debating on getting one. Um, they're not really yeah, springy, though, but... Uh, yeah. This anyway, this, it's a good, it's a good stock, and it had a uh, prior gap up also in April for those of you um, who actually decided to buy it um, and, and hold on to this thing. Uh, what, do, what do you mean they're not springy? The beds aren't. So what, what what do you need the uh, springy bed? You know, for? Not like typical coils. You know, you're used to growing up on typical traditional coil mattresses that have more spring to them. Yeah. Let me tell you that it works a lot better uh, for certain activities. I think you get better leverage. But I, anyways, I won't get into any detail on that. What about uh, water beds? That was big in the 70s. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I remember that. Uh, anyways, let's go through um, some other stocks. ROC is one. Uh, don't really care much for it. You know, it's kind of reversing. The market's looking uh, funky here. So, uh, you know, I'm not I'm not willing to start buying things on the long side. Um, I'm not interested in shorting silver or buying the is this the, the inverse ETF over the weekend. You can try it, but I don't know what to do about that, and I'm certainly not going to give you any advice on it. I'm not so clear on it. The only thing we would do is probably back away from our precious metals positions. If that implies that the ZSL, which is the inverse silver ETF, is going up, then I guess you could try and trade it. But it's, again, that's you know, I don't know. That's that's not our taste. I don't think. Um, Baidu, you know, gap up yesterday, undercut the low, so now maybe it's um, slowing down. It doesn't look like it's really got any thrust. So, MPE, Melco, Crown Entertainment, and a cheap stock keeps trucking, but you know, I don't know. What do you play? Uh, Fifty thousand shares to make any kind of real money. So I mean, it's okay, but we're not into it. Um, when I was talking about Aruba, somebody asked, was there a decent short entry? Well, there were up here, but I don't think once you had the break of the 200-day moving average, you didn't have any kind of rally, which I would have preferred to see. That doesn't mean that you couldn't come after it on this weak rally. But again, the short side is tricky here uh, for the same reason that the long side is tricky. There isn't, uh, it's a lot of news solutioning. Like I said, I think uh, being on the short side in a news-oriented environment is more dangerous than being on the long side. So. Somebody's telling us that August 4th is confirmed for the LinkedIn. Uh, somebody asked us about Yahoo. Is Yahoo a short? I don't know. I went, I went short. I think it's already down there. It wasn't a big leader. Uh, Whirlpool would be short. Whirlpool. I mean, I mean you're, if you're asking us, would we short this? Would we short that? If we haven't put out a short sale setup alert, then no, we, we wouldn't short it. You know, we're, we're not, like I said, we're not really uh, in the mood to start shorting everything. Um, but yeah, that stock looks like a dog. So, Netgear is another disappointing stock that looked great for a while and it's broken down. So, you might call this a late stage fail base. So, once it failed here and it rallies back up, that's possibly your short point. I wouldn't necessarily come at it here because you're undercutting these lows. Watch for a rally back up here. But again, we're only going to put out things if we think uh, there's a high probability of making decent money outside of a news oriented environment. So, VMware was trying to come out, and now it's sort of failing. But I've been suspicious of this the whole way. Uh, just as a group, you've seen a lot of the cloud networkers get hit. You see uh, Salesforce, you know, looks strong, and now it's looking weak. So, you know, the, the a lot of the patterns, when you look at a lot of the individual stock patterns, my problem with all of them is it's looking weak as you could possibly look. And so it seems to me that things are breaking down underneath the hood of the market. And so outside of the precious metals, I haven't seen any clean trends in anything. 
you, know, you pick up a pocket pivot here and there, and if you're lucky, it, it moves up uh, 10%, you can jam a position and maybe make 10 or 15% your portfolio, which is what I would try and do with something like Mollycorp, but it doesn't sustain itself, and, and uh, it's very choppy. And so a lot of that seems to argue that this market might, might get weaker, and I think that, and of course, Dr. K and I will certainly have a debate over this, but when I look at this, I'm thinking that if you do see a rally in the market that's very sharp as a result of the debt ceiling agreement that is likely to come you know, at the beginning of next week or sometime between now and then, that could become a shortable rally. And that's something I'm going to be watching very closely. And if I see things I think are pushing into a shortable zone, like rallying up into moving average, we'll put them out on the uh, short sale setup. So. Um, somebody asking, how much do we weigh psychological market indicators? How much do you weigh uh, psychological market indicators, Chris? Dr. K? Um, to an extent. I mean, it's certainly part of the mix. Uh, you know, I do keep an eye on them. So they do figure into uh, my judgment. You know, I, I, on IBD, you know, they always have the psychological indicator section. It's always interesting to see. I mean, obviously, there are useful at turning points when 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 uh, in, an indicator will hit an extreme. Then there, you know, it's interesting to take note of that, and uh, it may uh, weigh in on uh, one's decision. So, you know, they're certainly worth paying attention to. Yeah, I mean, there's two. Uh, let's see. I'm not sure if I got these right. Is, I mean, you can look at the put call ratios and things like that. You can look at uh, some of the other indicators. Let's let's do some of this. Uh, I'm going to go. Uh, it's one of my favorite websites, uh, DecisionPoint.com. I think it's a great, great site uh, for a lot of uh, sentiment data and other uh, market data. So let's look at the. You know, here's the investors. Uh, intelligence advisor sentiment poll. And right now what you're seeing is increase in bullishness. So it's starting to pick up. Does that mean anything? Not necessarily. Um, let's pull that one. This is the AAII, the American Association of Individual Investors. Uh, you're seeing bears drawing up here. A little bit more bullishness. Nothing really there. Uh, this is the one I think is interesting. This is a new survey. And what this is the NAAIM, which is the National Association of Active Investment Managers. It shows you what their percentage invested is. So right now you can see that they're pushing up towards uh, 70 at 66.31% invested. And you can see that when they get out of the market and are very, uh, very lightly invested, that often that's the end of a pullback. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's the bottom of a of a pullback and you get a little rally like here you did and again they dried up uh, here but then you rolled over. I think when you have a sustained period of being uh, lightly invested then that means that you might be near a low. So hmm, let's see here. Let's like to know uh, about uh, buying puts to protect large long AGQ and DGP positions and uh, well we don't do anything with options but uh, you know if you know what you're doing with them and you know how to properly hedge uh, large positions in stocks then by all means you know do use them uh, at your disposal. Uh, personally I prefer just to sell that sell out the position or sell out a, a certain measure of position um, using cash as my hedge and that's what I've always done that's what I'm very comfortable doing. I'm going to ask everyone to bear with me for a second. It looks like uh, my mouse decided to die, and I think he ran out of batteries, so I'm going to get some batteries. Dr. K, keep talking. Well, how about touchpad? <laughs> touchpad auxiliary. I hate those touchpads. I, I can't stand them. It's nice to have. Uh, I always have an auxiliary uh, mouse just in case. Okay, so now let's see. Um, we've got another question about uh, when you mentioned that the probability of a bounce is high, does that mean greater than 50%? Well, yeah, sure. Um, if we're going to say it's a high probability, that, that implies certainly greater than 50%. And 
high probability is just a, a qualitative phrase. So, uh, in other words, very difficult in many cases to pinpoint exactly what that uh, probability will be. Expression. Okay, there we go. We're back. <laughs> Murphy's Law at work. My mouse goes out right smack in the middle of a presentation here. Anyways. Um, Oh, someone also wanted to know about uh, point and figure charts for price targets since you, since you uh, use them from time to time. On what? What was that? Point and figure charts uh, for price targets since you, you use them from time to time. Um, yeah, I think that's... Uh, they wanted, I guess, to know just the basic methodology behind, you know, yeah, just let, let me tell you what I use point and figure charts for primarily, and that is uh, essentially trying to determine price targets. Now, I do that in conjunction with the standard O'Neill method of uh, you know, using PE expansions and earnings and all that to come up with a potential price target based on an assumed PE expansion. So that's one way to do it. But I also like to corroborate that with, uh, let's see, what was that here? So you're going to see a SLV chart. When we had this breakout here, this was giving you a price target of uh, 50. And now you have this breakout from what is a triple top, a bullish uh, triple top breakout. And, and this is pretty easy because it, it gives you the upside price target right now is 55 based on this breakout. And it tends to work pretty well when something's just coming out of a, an area of consolidation. But it's not 100% foolproof. I use it for Amazon back in 2003, and it worked very well. But you know, you're going to find, for example, if you use it for um, a stock like Netflix, very difficult uh, here. You know, where you get you get this big thrust, and then it just comes right back in. You get another big thrust out of this consolidation, it comes right back in. So it's basically just throwing you all over the place. And right now, you have a three-box reversal, and you have a downside price objective of 244 on Netflix. But it's not very useful for determining uh, price targets uh, if the stock is not very coherent. So there's just one tool. you know. And again, everybody's always looking for the uh, holy grail uh, of, of things to, to be looking at. But nothing is 100% uh, perfect or 100% foolproof. So it's just one tool to use. And a lot of times if, if I get close with the, the PE uh, expansion type of price target and that sort of is corroborated by the uh, point and figure chart, then that gives it some weight. I remember in 2003, Bill O'Neill had Amazon and I had Amazon at the time. And we were talking, and his price target was 60, and mine was 61, based on, uh, I was using the point and figure, he was using a P expansion. And it pretty much hit that on the nose and, and rolled over from there. So, you know, in that case, we got lucky. But, again, it's not a holy grail. It's just a tool to use among many other tools. So, anyways, <clears throat> we'll continue here with some of the questions. Would you bag profits on Apple and Baidu or watch? I don't know. I don't own them, so I don't know what I would do. Um, here's a question for you, Dr. K. The last buy signal, let's pull up a chart of the TNA. I think this is a good question. The last buy signal in the market direction model was on July 13th when the TNA was around 84. Now it's 75, down 10 or 11%. Why hasn't the fail safe kicked in? Ah, uh, that's a good question. Now the fail safe is based on the NASDAQ composite. So when I say that um, on average the, uh, the model tends to have a fail safe that contains losses to within 2%, um, that's, that's a pretty typical um, within 2%. That's on the NASDAQ. So if you have a more volatile instrument like the TNA, uh, which is at least three times the volatility of the NASDAQ, um, and I would argue more because it's really mirroring the Rus Russell 2000, and the Russell 2000 is uh, composed of small cap stocks. So the Russell 2000 historically is more volatile than the NASDAQ composite. That's why you have the TNA down 10% from that buy signal, and that's why we always advise if you're going to be invested in uh, leveraged ETFs such as this one, you position size accordingly. Um, and if it violates your uh, any of your own personal risk tolerance rules, 
then you might opt to buy instead a two times or one times ETF. Yeah. And I would say for the TNA to be down 10 or 11 percent uh, from a buy signal, that's pretty much within acceptable ranges, it seems like to me. Historically, that's pretty typical. Uh, but from the earlier question about is the model nearing a switch in signals, yes, it is. So, uh, you know, sit tight uh, because uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see the model switch signals within the next day or so. Yeah, so anything could happen. It's pretty much a fluid situation. And really, the only way we're playing this market right now is with the precious metals. And we're trying to finesse a little bit by selling half today. Whether that turns out to be the smart thing to do or not uh, remains to be seen. And we debated it, and uh, that was the compromise on our end. So you have to figure out what you want to do. Uh, the portfolio simulator is going to stay where he's at because he's only 25 and 25 in silver and gold. So he's only half invested there, and he's in the 1x one times ETFs. Uh, somebody's asking about uh, the four-hour workshop that we're supposed to do at the Vegas show in November. Well, that show is November 16th through 19th, so I believe it's a uh, Wednesday through Saturday, Saturday being the last day, of course, and that's the week before Thanksgiving for you uh, Americans out there. Uh, we're going to show up, I believe, on Wednesday, and we're doing a one-hour presentation uh, we're not sure exactly what that's going to be about yet on uh, Thursday. And then we're going to do the four-hour workshop, I believe, at 1 p.m. on Friday, the 18th. Now, that's what I understand. That's what they want us to do. Uh, and it's a big honor to be asked to do this because they only ask two or three other people, and they ask us. Um, you know, sometimes I ask myself why, but they seem to uh, like our material. Uh, they like the crowds that we draw, and uh, they want to give us top billing. So we'll take it. You know, it's nice to be in demand. Um, so, and we hope to put together something. We started to outline it. At least I've started to outline it. Uh, and it will be more uh, hands-on. But it'll encompass a lot of the techniques we talk about in our book. It is not intended at all to be a replacement for any canned slim seminars or workshops that O'Neill and IBD do. Not at all. So, don't expect that we're going to do any of that stuff. Uh, that's them. Well, there, yeah, there's, I mean, there's, we've really, really grown apart from, you know, the canceling methodology. You know, that's something I used in the 90s. Um, and, you know, certainly the pocket pivot, the gap up method, you know, a lot of the methodologies that we talk about in our book and talk about on the website have nothing to do with uh, the O'Neill and Company uh, systematics. So, you know, it is nice to be uh, acknowledged for, you know, what we've you know, the, the paths that we've carved out and uh, to be able to uh, discuss it in full. At the uh, yeah. at the money show, yeah. So it'll be fun. You know, we have carved out our own path to some extent, but it's still an O'Neill sort of uh, ethos. And then our new book, uh, we have a meeting next Tuesday, I think, with our publisher to start outlining the book. So, you know, right now we have a lot of notes and things, but nothing is really coherent. So it's going to take a fair bit of work, and I, I'm going to say you won't see anything for about a year, probably, unless Wiley really pushes us. And the last time we did the book in three three months, and I would like to take longer this time. So somebody asked a good question. Um, would you just go on vacation, or is it too volatile to not watch like a hawk? Well, if you're not in, you don't have to watch anything. So there's always that potential. you know. And the way I look at it, you can take a vacation anytime, even in a bull market. You can always come back at some point. There's nothing wrong with that. But on the other hand, unless you're running high-octane positions and trying to run aggressive, concentrated positions uh, where a small movement is going to hit you with a big loss, and I think you can just take the Nicholas Darvis method, which is as long as the stock acts within uh, well within a certain range and stays within its base and doesn't violate certain uh, stop-out levels, you know, such as the 10-day or the 50-day moving average, whatever you're using for a particular stop, then all you have to do is do what the portfolio simulator dude is doing right now with silver and gold. He's not worried about uh, running 120% position in, in SLV or AGQ like we are and having to keep an eye on it and worried whether he should take some profits out at 40 bucks on the SLB. He's got a stop on his positions at 36.71 for the SLB and 151.86 on the GLB. Those are his trailing stops, and he's just going to leave uh, stop loss orders with his broker and just let it run. And that's how he's approaching it. So, you know, it depends on what you want to do. If you want to trade it aggressively and try to keep your risk in check if things start to get out of hand so you want to be there to watch for that then that's up to you but yeah you, I think you can take a vacation whether you're in the market or not it really depends on whether you're using a very aggressive style like I might in my own account whether you're using a less aggressive but more 
methodical style like Dr. Tay does or whether you're using a very non-aggressive, almost slow and clunky style like the portfolio simulator dude does. So it's really kind of up, up to you. You know, Nicholas Darvis was able to travel all over the world dancing his heart away and uh, he did fine. So uh, somebody asked, are you just seeing a lot of late stage bases? You are seeing a lot of what could be late stage bases, but it's not really clear that a, a base is late stage until it's late stage. I mean, in other words, until it breaks down. So is this a late stage breakout? Well, IBD has talked about it, and I've talked about it, uh, and maybe it is. Maybe you just run up here, and this, thing, this whole thing fails from here. But uh, we'll just have to see. But there are a lot of these patterns where these stocks have been going for a while, and they seem pretty obvious to us and probably to everybody else. And so, yeah, that's suspect. Um, can you recall other news-dominated environments? Uh, did you handle them similarly? I mean, one of the big news uh, uh, environments I remember was March of 2003 when we were going into Iraq, and you know there'd be news every other day about the troops stopping their movement and they halted. I remember when they announced that they halted all the troops because uh, they had all come into Iraq too quick and they were getting ahead of themselves, I guess. And so when they halted that, you know, the market sold off for a couple of days. In fact, maybe we could go back and look at that. Um, so let's go back to uh, 2003. I go way, way, way back. And I don't think the volume is going to follow me uh, that far back, but we'll look at the price action. But if we go back to that, what's that, like March uh, 13th or something, wasn't it, Dr. K? Uh, let me see here. Sounds pretty close. Here's 2004, so let's get to March. March 12th, I think. Okay. Yeah, and, and I remember that was a very news, you know, we had, I think you had a follow through date here. And then we had these chop, this choppiness in here as uh, the news was coming out. And then once things started to clarify, we started to move up and out. But I think you have the follow through date here on March 17th. And yet, notice how you have the follow through date and you move up and you come back in. So this is a very Actually, choppy day, but March, basically... March 12th was the, uh, the first follow through day on the model. That was when the model... March 12th? Yeah, March 12th. Right. right here. So that would have been right there. And that was because you were not you were counting this as a oh, low wait a there. Second. I remember at, I was no, at a meal right. at the time. That's right. That's exactly right. Now what you said is right. I was looking it's at the... the 17th. Right. That's and I remember right. it was choppy, okay? And uh, if some of you recall, I've talked about playing Amazon. It was one of the stocks I played at the time. And I want to go to a weekly chart on Amazon. Um, and we can look also what happened. So this gives you some idea of how you had to handle it. And it was a lot of back and forth. So it took a little bit of time to get going. Just like right now, you may be in a position where the market uh, needs some time to get going here. So it looks like we're trying to rally now. Maybe there's some news or something. I don't know. But let's go back. Anybody see anything out there? A lot of questions. Um, for those of you who are asking about the workshop, yeah, just, I would just go to the Money Show uh, website. We'll put that out when we have it. But anyways, okay, so here is the week. Let me pull this up here. So let's go to March. This is the week that you had the follow-through. Now notice you had the follow-through. Amazon broke out. And then it pulled back. And this is a stock that I bought here on the pullback. So what was my approach here? It was very news-oriented. So I actually bought on weakness here. And I remember Bill having an institutional meeting and saying that this is really the best way to operate was to try and buy on weakness. Uh, and you might be off for a point or two for a little while, but that would be a better uh, position than trying to buy on strength. And, of course, if you did here, you know, this was actually a couple that handle on, on Amazon. It broke out. That was premature. And... Uh, broke down and then uh, that was actually the near the bottom came out and you broke out again so I bought Amazon here and it ran all the way to 60 bucks as I was talking about and then it, it went into a correction but that was kind of the way it handled it buying weakness so what I'm doing here you notice on MCP for example we traded that or I traded that we have a position ourselves in the portfolio Dr. K and I run together but you know we're buying that initially on pocket pivot so pocket pivots give you a little bit of a a weapon to use, but they're they're not foolproof like anything else. So that's that's one way to handle a news oriented environment is use the news when it might be negative to uh, step into things. So, but we'll see what happens here. You know, I'm wondering if there's some news on a uh, 
debt ceiling deal right now. I'm seeing the market rally, but whatever. Um, somebody wants to know if we've read the book, Use the News by Maria Bartiromo. No, I wouldn't read anything by Maria Bartiromo. Um, I don't know, maybe it's a good book. Did Can Slim work much better in the 80s and in the 90s? I think Can Slim worked much better in the 90s when you had a trending market. Uh, yeah, it didn't, it didn't work uh, very well in 2004 or 2005 um, during those fairly compressed sideways markets. Um, yeah, there were occasional standouts that did that did do well, but on balance, you couldn't you couldn't buy um, a, a larger group of stocks that were breaking out and expect to do like you did in the 1990s. No, um, and, and, and it, it, that matter because the 1980s were pretty cleanly trending as well. So yeah, 2004, 2005 were tough years, and that, that, that's actually what inspired um, the uh, the pocket pivot concept. Yeah, and you know, let's just look at this. Um, look at the NASDAQ, okay? I'm going to go to a monthly chart here. So this will, don't pay attention to any of the moving averages. Um, here's a NASDAQ, okay? This is, uh, this is the 90s for the NASDAQ, okay? Here's 1990. You had this shakeout when uh, Iraq invaded uh, uh, Kuwait, and then the market broke out, and this is what the stock market looked like throughout the 90s on a monthly basis until it topped. So that was a nice, clean, trending move. Now, from 2000 to today, it's just a very choppy, uh, difficult environment. So I think it worked a lot better during that period. It doesn't mean it can't still work if you're in the right stocks, but I, I do think it was a much cleaner period. So all I have to say is I'm glad I made In 2009, uh, I think yeah, O'Neill went on record saying that was the most challenging year of his 50-year career because 2009 was led by junk off the bottom stocks, so canceling stocks um, lagged, and uh, yeah. and so it was. It 2009 was tough. I would I was telling Gil earlier today that I, I would bet that O'Neill would agree and say that 2011 actually uh, trumps 2009 in terms of difficulty. Yeah, just because yeah. it's gone nowhere, it's just been sloppy and volatile, and really hasn't. Uh, no trends have persisted so far this year. Yeah. So somebody asked why did I leave O'Neill. His bill was mean. No, that's not true. Um, <laughs> uh, do I really get into this? I, I mean, to me, first of all, it's like how much is enough? I've made piles and piles of money, uh, enough so that I haven't really had to worry about anything since I left O'Neill. And that includes even getting you know, whacked in 2009 and losing money because I don't allocate all my money to the market. Um, and I have piles of money behind that, and I also have piles of money that I used to buy gold in 2000, and that's been a five-bagger for me, so I've made huge gains on that. Um, but for me, I don't know, eight years there, I didn't really think that uh, the direction of the company was uh, going to be successful. They made a lot of changes there, brought in a new sales manager on the institutional side, and to me it seemed like a lot of poor decisions. And my feeling was that in order to be... Uh, just to be honest, uh, I couldn't sit there and support what was going on internally in terms of the business. Uh, and at the same time, I didn't want to be a gadfly because a lot of people would come into my office when I was chief market strategist and had been moved out of institutional services. A lot of people were coming into my office constantly and complaining about everything. And to me, that's just being negative. And uh, so it's kind of like, how much is enough? Uh, I had made plenty of money, and I didn't think I could support where the firm was going in terms of the business. I mean, I fully support uh, O'Neill's work in the market. It's brilliant stuff. Uh, but I think to some extent the O'Neill organization is a study, a case study in how you can have brilliant market work and really squander a brilliant brand uh, by not really understanding or running the business correctly. So, you know, I just had to be honest. And if I couldn't support it, then I felt, the loyal thing to do uh, to build on the organization was to just step away, and that's what I did. So I went off and messed around did my own stuff. Now, in hindsight, would I have started a fund like I did, trying to run money my style, where you have wild swings, 20% or more, you know, in a in a week or a month? Uh, probably not. But would I have, uh, in hindsight, left O'Neill? Yeah, definitely. So it was time to go. Who makes the general market calls at IBD? I have no idea. Uh, Good question, but you might want to call them up and ask them. I don't know. Um, I think that for the most part, Bill leaves it up to the, the, the guys in uh, in there, and they're they're reasonably they get it they get it right most of the time. They do a good job. So I know Chris Gessel is an editor there. He's a smart guy. He knows what he's doing. Um, 
and other people there as well. So, uh, like I said, MarketWise is a very brilliant organization, brilliant, utterly brilliant. But the disappointing part is they don't really put it together on the business side. And, uh, I could write a book about that, but I'm not. In any case, I think that pretty well sums up uh, today's webinar. I hope it was useful. But again, what we're looking at here is news-oriented environment. Cleanest trends are in precious metals. Precious metals may pull back when the debt uh, ceiling deal is announced. We would use that as an opportunity to be buying. I would think that you're looking at 10% max on the SLB, but it could be less than that. GLD, I think, should hold the 151.86 low if you had a pullback. It may be that a lot of this is already baked into the market, okay? So you kind of want to play it by ear. But for the most part, the precious metals are in a trend, and they look fine. Uh, stocks that we're watching, we went over, and there are very few that really look in uh, prime position to be buying right now. So I think there's some risk there, and I think the earnings roulette season has also proven that out. So you're dealing with that as well. So to us, you know, for our money, it seems to be uh, being focused on the precious metals seems to be the place to be. That has yielded some progress. We're having a very good uh, 2011. You know, knock wood. Yeah, and I would think that you know, uh, I know I read something that Bill O'Neill said that 2009 was probably the most difficult environment he's ever seen in his career. I would think that uh, you know, we were talking about this this morning. He might think that 2011 could replace 2009. This has been even more difficult, and so we're happy that we kind of got a, you know, beat on it and have it wired down. And so on that basis, we've been able to do pretty well so far this year. But like I said, knock wood, because things can always change. Uh, meanwhile, you know, I don't think there's a lot of downside uh, juice on the short side. Now I could be wrong, but I, what I would be doing there, like I said, is we're watching for a rally that comes on the news of the debt ceiling. Uh, agreement, and I might look at shorting into that. On the other hand, you, know, you might get QE3 coming here in some other form, and then that might be evident in some more stocks uh, acting well and the market uh, turning back to the upside. But we'll just have to see. So it's a very difficult and unfair environment. So the only thing we see to play are the precious metals. Um, keep an eye on LinkedIn, which I got up here on my chart. And that's pretty much uh, where we're at right now with the market. If we see anything else, like on Monday we did an after hours uh, go view webinar, which we then put up on YouTube. If we see anything else, well, Dr. K and I will consult and put that up out there for you guys. But that's pretty much where we're at for now. All right. Thanks for listening, and uh, we'll catch you guys next time. Take care, everybody.